Hi, just a little bit of self-promotion before this video begins. This video forms part of a much longer course on teaching primary school science, which you can access on Udemy. I'll put a link to the course in the video description below. I'll also put some links up during the video and a QR code you can scan as well. Here we go. lecture nine where we're going to look at dealing with misconceptions so we will look at uh, what misconceptions are some strategies for eliciting those misconceptions and some ways of dealing with the misconceptions once you've identified them so what do children already know there's a really good book called misconceptions in primary science by michael allen that's worth a read uh, the individual's constructions are not drawn on blank slate but instead built on previously created structures this is in essence uh, constructivism uh, pupils do not come to school as an empty vessel, ready to be filled with science knowledge. Rather, they come with their own set of ideas and concepts that they will have built to explain how the world around them works. So, constructivism was developed by psychologists such as Piaget and Vygotsky, so read more of their work if you're interested in this. Leonard, in 1992, stated that the essence of constructivist theory is the idea that learners must uh, individually discover and transform complex information if they are to make it their own. So what is a misconception? A misconception is a view that doesn't fully coincide with a scientific view. It's at odds with the accepted science and can be difficult to change or reform. Um, and these become a source of misconceptions when met in a formal science lesson. Quite often these existing ideas come from informal play or through watching television shows and films. Rosalind Driver made a huge contribution to the field of understanding misconceptions in science. She believed that students construct their understanding of the world through their observations and interactions with their peers and they create a coherent set of alternative conceptions. They're based on common sense but wrong logic. She recognised that students need teacher guidance if they are to make sense of the world uh, and that pupils are unlikely to give up alternative conceptions easily so lessons must be carefully designed to help them make that leap. Often in a lesson there's a number of issues that make it difficult for students to discover meaning for themselves. Uh, the students are unclear about what to focus on. For example in the practical they may focus on the spoon stirring the liquid when the actual intended outcome was to focus on the solution inside the beaker. They hold preconceptions about what they will see so they will expect a heavy object to fall faster and they're unclear of the meaning of scientific conventions. So they're unclear what the arrow is, is referring to in the diagram because in some lessons it's a force in physics, it's part of a food chain or it's just an arrow labelling a diagram. Uh, in some cases children can hold both the misconception and the scientific idea at the same time and some of these misconceptions will persist despite our efforts to um, get rid of them. Even when presented with new evidence, people modify it to fit the model they've got already and they try and crowbar it in. So examples of misconception that children have, uh, they think the seeds aren't alive, they think that um, and all animals are furry, have four legs, uh, they think that a bee is not an animal because it's an insect, they don't see insects as being animals, that a whale is a fish because it lives in the sea, they think that um, because snakes look like earthworms, they're also invertebrates, uh, that all creepy crawlies are insects. Um, they might think that a material is something used for building clothing. Um, you know, we talk about the word material, often we think about fabric. They think that brick and concrete are examples of rocks. They might think that all light objects float and all heavy objects sink, um, that an iceberg is both floating and sinking at the same time. So they can hold these different ideas. So some strategies for eliciting misconceptions, we mentioned a few of these in the previous lesson. So things like questioning and concept cartoons and drawings and models and making concept maps and websites such as Explorify. We'll mention them again and go through these in more detail in the assessment lecture as well. So questioning is the most straightforward way to ask people directly to elicit their ideas um, and what they know. It could be combined with mini whiteboards where people can write their answers and hold them up. Uh, diagnostic question banks can be used. There's a nice um, set of resources called the Best Evidence in Science Team. Teaching, um, and they're trialing a bank of diagnostic questions that can reveal misunderstandings. This is an example of best evidence in science education. You can get these via the STEM learning website. You would read through the slide with the children and ask them to look carefully at the images, uh, look at the statements, and think about which of these do they agree with. What do they know? What do they know about why it gets dark at night? Which picture best shows what the earth is like? Follow up questions can you explain why you think this and so on. You're hoping they're going to go with B. Um, the earth is a sphere. If they come up with other answers then it gives you a chance to draw ideas out from them and explain why. Concept cartoons, um, these were pioneered by Brenda Keogh and Stuart Naylor in the early 90s to promote discussion and challenge their ideas. The concept cartoons are used um, 
by presenting a, a scientific concept with a couple of children discussing it and different viewpoints are put forward and the pupils might decide who they agree with, who they disagree with and it hopefully will create some cognitive conflict and reveal some misconceptions with them. So this is the one we've mentioned previously about the snowman melting. Here's one about condensation on the glass. Can the children explain where the water comes from that sits on the side of the glass? Annotated pictures and diagrams, so asking people to draw an annotated picture can give the teacher an idea of what pupils are thinking. Um, if they're asked to draw animals, they only draw four-legged animals, they include snakes and fish and birds. Uh, these are quite good as a basis then for further questions. Uh, you could also ask children to draw concept maps, give the children the keywords and ask them to cut them out and lay them out on their concept map. Um, also they can add additional words that they know of and they can link them with pencil lines, explain why they've linked them together more diagrams here trying to ask um, children to draw what's inside our bodies. So dealing with the misconceptions, how do you correct a misconception when you found out what they are? Uh, it's important to challenge the ideas in a non-threatening way. Pupils need to be able to test out their ideas and then experience that cognitive conflict. Um, we shouldn't just tell them that they're wrong and explain what they should think instead, that's counterproductive. The challenge for a teacher is to organise those ideas and misconceptions into concepts which are accurate and explicit. So we need to um, not ignore the misconceptions because they're the foundations upon which new knowledge is built, but we need to link what we're going to do with them with the prior knowledge. So we introduce a situation where the misconception is shown, maybe a movie clip. So for example, if we're thinking about the fact that sound cannot travel through a vacuum, maybe we've got a clip from movies showing loud explosions in space, and then we can talk about the fact that sound cannot travel through a vacuum, and maybe we can find a video that shows a situation where you know, you've got a, a bell ringing inside a vacuum and it's not being able to be heard. So you provide, well, why is that happening? You can investigate through practical work to help address the misconception. Pupils can make their prediction, what they think will happen and why they think that. That gives them a chance to explain their reasoning. Then we do an experiment to see if they are correct. And then if their prediction is shown to be wrong, then that leads to cognitive conflict. I hope then they'll, they'll reject the wrong idea and assimilate that scientific concept into their, their understanding. So the Primary Science Teacher Trust and Plan Assessment both have some really good guides to common misconceptions and resources you can download which will help you. So PSTT have some resources on, on the link there. The Plan Assessment website has um, the knowledge matrices and on each of the knowledge matrices for each unit they highlight the common misconceptions which um, you might meet which children commonly have. This is an approach from Nikki Kaiser, which um, is a three-stage approach to planning around misconceptions called RADAR. So you research and anticipate. So think about likely misconceptions before you enter the classroom. Research using some results I've just given you, like PSDT and um, plan assessment. So you've got an idea what the misconceptions might be. Diagnose and address. So this might be using a, a, a text. It might be the best evidence science teaching activity. It might be a concept cartoon, the things we just talked about and then um, assess and review. So check and recheck that our students understand the ideas and the original topic um, and also check again later on whether those misconceptions still persist. If you're interested in that, I've put the link on there. It's from the Education Endowment Foundation uh, blog. What should we be doing? So provide children of all ages with hands-on practical work to help embed the concept in a mental schema, um, but also make sure they make predictions first so you've got that cognitive conflict if you need it. Um, if an idea is, is derived from a narrow range of evidence, then we need to provide them with more evidence to help them see that their misconception is incorrect. If testing the prediction um, based idea could help challenge the child's existing ideas, then help the child to make that prediction and consider the challenge. So after they think about you know, what they're gonna do and how the fair test will work and, and using their process skills um, to test that prediction. If it's their use of language and vocabulary that is suspect, then ask them to give examples of um, what they understand the words to mean and non-examples. Maybe we can develop a scientific dictionary or a word bank which goes through what these science words actually mean. A lot of words have an everyday use and a scientific use, so we need to make sure we're clear on what the scientific uses of these words mean, like weight um, and mass. They have, you know, weight means a different thing to a scientist than it does in everyday language. Um, if children have a sort of correct idea about a phenomenon in one situation but don't recognise that the same explanation holds in different situations, uh, then can you help them by making links between the situations? So repeating experiments, so we're looking at evaporation, can we show evaporation in different situations, so puddles on the playground, uh, clothes on the washing line, water in a, in a dish, all to show that actually evaporation will happen in different situations so we can explain what, what's going on there. So in summary, we should be looking at starting with the correct scientific view, 
Um, once scientific ideas have been introduced, then we can introduce misconceptions, um, explain or even show why the misconception is wrong. Then we provide cognitive conflict as a strategy to promote that reorganisation of the ideas. And then we need to fill in the gaps. We provide tasks where the students have to demonstrate they understand the scientific idea, so they can demonstrate why right is right, and so they're aware of the misconception why wrong is wrong. So in this lecture we've had a look at uh, what misconceptions are, we've looked at some strategies for listing those misconceptions and we've started to look at some ideas of how you will deal with misconceptions.